Now, if you represent the seller, you become a broker of the seller or the agent of the seller. That relationship that gets created is through the listing agreement that confers special agency, meaning I have one activity, market the property for sale on that one property. That's what special agency is. And you get to utilize the service of other brokers to bring a buyer to them. That is the selling agent. So I'm going to market the property to other agents who may act as a selling agent for their buyer to come and look at our listing. If I work with the buyer, I would be a broker, becomes an agency with the buyer. That relationship is established through a express agency by getting them to sign the buyer's agency agreement. We're going to get into this and this fallacy in one of the next chapters. And you are the one that becomes responsible for helping locate the real estate that meets the requirements of your buyer. You are going to send them these houses and go, hey, dude, here's the house you told me you wanted, you know, three bedroom, two bath, 1,500 square feet. Here's one that just came on the market. Are you interested in it? That's what you do. If you are a property manager, you become the agent of the owner of the company or the investor. And that relationship is created by a property management agreement, which we will get into as well. Now, remember, the property manager is conferred general agency. They can do multiple things like enter into contracts, screen tenants, if you are a property manager. All right. So, so far, we have been talking about this thing called single agency. This is a question that comes up a lot. You can, in fact, in many law, uh, many states, become what is called a dual agency. A dual agency. Now, in Indiana, we are one of the few that actually call this limited agency. All right. And you'll see why we call it limited. So in Indiana, we actually have a form called the limited agency agreement. We do not use the word dual. Dual is to Indiana agents is like using the word ain't. <laughs> I'll know what you mean if you say dual, but I just don't think you're educated enough because in Indiana, we call it limited agency. All right. Most other states call it dual. Indiana is one of the few that does that. A dual agency is when you represent both the buyer and the seller on the same deal. That last part is very important. You understand that they represent both the buyer and the seller on the same deal. So it's important you understand that because you could work for a buyer that is trying to buy another property, but you could also be working for that same person selling their home that they're going to sell. That is two single agencies, all right? So make sure you understand what I just said. If not, hit the pause, go back and listen. I am working for a buyer and a seller on the same house. I have got the house listed and a buyer calls me and says, I want to see your listing. Now I am working under dual agency where I'm representing both the buyer and the seller on the same property. That is not the same as me having one client and I'm selling his house and then going to help him find another house to buy. That's not dual agency. That is two single agencies back to back. So <clears throat> dual agencies in most states is legal. However, you must get <clears throat> written permission from both parties agreeing to this in advance in writing. And the rule uh, is called what? The rule that requires it to be in writing? We just talked about it, the statute of frauds. So you must get permission 
from both the seller and the buyer to act as a dual agency. <clears throat> so the scenario would look something like this. You've got a house listed and they've signed a listing agreement and everything's cool and copacetic. You put a sign in the yard and somebody calls you and go, hey man, I saw your listing. Can I go, will you show me the house? And you say, yeah, I'll meet you there in 10 minutes. So you meet them and in the front yard, you go, okay, hold on a minute. You know, I've got this house listed because you saw the sign. Are you okay with the fact that I'm the listing agent on this property? And they say, yes, that's fine. And you say, okay, sign this form. And then you say, wait here a minute. And you walk up to the front door and knock on the front door and go, hey, it's me, your listing agent. But I want you to know that I've got a buyer that wants to come see the house. Do you mind if I represent him on the, buying your property? And he says, yes, that's fine. You can do that. And you say, great, sign this form. And then he signs the form. And now you have written disclosure to both properties. And now you can say, okay, great. We're coming in to see the property. And you call, hey, buyer, come on in. Let's go see the property. That is a perfectly legal transaction of dual agency. Now, either party can say no. You could ask the buyer and the buyer says, yeah. And you say, okay, sign this form, wait here. You go up to the seller and knock on the door and say, hey, I got a buyer. Do you mind if I be his agent? And the seller could say, no, I do not want you to act in that capacity because you know a lot of stuff about me and my properties. If that happens, which I have had it happen at least once in my career, you cannot help the buyer because you are already an agent of the seller. So you got to abide his, remember, you got to obey. And he has said no. So now you got to go back out and tell the buyer, hey, man, I can't show you the house. But what I can do is call one of my buddies who will show you the house. Now it's no longer dual agency, all right? So it must be written, informed consent prior to doing any agency activities. I have seen many people do this, where they go and show the house and they do all the negotiation and then they have them sign the uh, form. Well, what happens if the seller at that point says no? <laughs> so you need to have them sign the form, informed consent, prior to doing any activities that would require a license, all right? If you make a mistake and accidentally give uh, implied agency, that would be considered undisclosed dual agency. So let's say they call you back to that example and they go, hey, how much is the house? And you say 400,000. That's not agency because you're not helping them. But they say, is he motivated? And you say, yes, he told me to tell you is motivated. Ding, 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 ding. That may be undisclosed dual agency because you just created implied agency with that guy on the phone without getting permission from the listing agent or from the seller to allow you to act as the buyer's agent. And I told you implied agency is still agency. It's just a bad one. So you could get yourself into even more hot water by creating agency that was implied, but worse, creating it with a listing that you have, and now you have undisclosed dual agency, which is also a prohibition under the Indiana state rules, under all the state rules, as a matter of fact. Now, there are some states that do not allow that. Wyoming, Alaska, Vermont, Colorado, Florida, Texas, Maryland, Kansas. These states don't even allow you to be a dual agent, all right? They don't even allow it. You cannot be both sides. You cannot represent both sides. And I'm here to tell you right now, my opinion there should be no such thing as dual agency. I don't believe that you can do it. It's virtually impossible. 
Think about your obligations, cold AC. One of your obligations is to disclose everything you know about the deal, right? That's the D. One of your obligations is to keep confidential information that you know. That's the C one in AC. How do I tell my buyer everything I know about the property, which is required, but yet keep confidential information that the seller told me, which is required? So you can see my point that I'm getting at. How do you truly give all six of those loyalties to both people? You cannot, in my opinion. Now, that's just my opinion. I'm here to tell you that all of the states in the United States, except those mentioned right there, allow this activity to happen. I don't think it's right. I don't think it can be done. All right. Now, there's another type of agency that is called designated agency. Sometimes you will hear it called in-house agency. This is different than outhouse agency because that would be shitty. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was low hanging fruit. I had to go for that. Designated agency or in-house agency is when there are two agents of mine, but it is split, meaning I have one of my agents is the listing agent and one of my agents is working with the buyer. So they're the selling agent, even though they technically both work for me, I can se separate them by giving information to one and information to the other. So that is called designated agency or sometimes in-house agency. That is not dual agency. That does not require the dual agency form to be signed because it technically is two separate people. All right. Now, this non-agency is the one that we talked about earlier, where most states now have going towards disallowing this. A non-agency uh, is, think about this. You've got single agency, you represent one side or the other. You've got dual agency where you represent both sides at the same deal. Think of non-agency as representing no sides. All right. That's what we talked about. Sometimes you will hear them call it a transactional broker, where your only obligation is to the transaction. And I owe no fiduciary obligations to either party. And I'm mainly just looking at the transaction and going, hey, sign here, sign here, put a date there. All right, pay him the money, give him the deed, and we're good. That is a non-agent. Most states allow that, but I'm telling you, there are a lot of bars in the country, and I mean like <laughs> attorney bars, that are going after agents for practicing law because there is no agency there for either side, and they are discussing a legal contract called a purchase agreement. You must treat both parties honestly and fairly, but you certainly would not help or have loyalty to either one. Okay. So this whole time we have been talking about agency. We talked about agency is the relationship that gets created between the agent and the client. Well, at some point, this agency has to end. It can't go on forever. So how do you terminate agency? Well, agency is terminated in seven ways, in one of seven ways. Listing agency is terminated in one of seven ways. The most common way is the completion of the agency. You sold the house, the house closed, the deal closed, the deed got delivered and accepted, Boop. property transferred, agency got terminated. We did what we were supposed to do. Death of either party. Now, hold on. 
Remember the parties are me or the client, not you. You are merely representing me in the deal. So it's the death of the managing broker or the death of the seller that would terminate this agency. If for some reason, God forbid, you would pass away, I would just have another agent take over because it's the death of the managing broker or the death of the client. The destruction of the property. I have actually had this happen. I had a closing scheduled for one o'clock on some day years ago. I got a call about 1130 in the morning from the title company saying, hey man, your one o'clock closing has been stopped. And I'm like, oh dude, why? I've already spent this commission. You know how most, most people are, right? Dude, I'm getting paid today. I'm going to go out and I went out. I've already spent this commission. And they said, well, unfortunately, the house got hit by lightning this morning and burnt to the ground. <laughs> oh, crap. The property got destroyed. Now, there's something very key with this number three right here that I want you to understand. Destruction of the property is one of the seven ways that terminates the listing agency. When it comes to buyer's agency, the one that I was involved with, because I was the buyer, representing the buyer, destruction of the property is not one of the ways that terminates agency. There are only six ways that terminate the buyer's agency. What did I say? There are seven that terminate the listing agency. This is the one that gets kicked out. That house that burnt to the ground, I was representing the buyer. That house that got burnt to the ground did not terminate my agency with my buyer. We would just go find another property. But what it does do is terminate the listing agency's agency because there is no longer a property to list for sale. So understand that there are seven ways to terminate listing agency. There are only six ways to terminate the buyer's agency. And this is the one that is not in there. The property being destroyed has nothing to do with my buyer. 